Scientific advancement is a tireless and often fruitless endeavour. It can take decades or even centuries for difficult advancements to be achieved as researchers painstakingly analyse a problem from every possible angle trying to find a solution. It's usually a slow and deliberate process and major breakthroughs are rarely made overnight. Rarely? doesn't mean never. Sometimes these breakthroughs happen entirely by accident. A scientist could discover a new and practical application for their research that wasn't the intended result, or their experiment may reveal something completely unrelated. Today, we're going to look at some of the greatest scientific discoveries that were completely unintentional. Penicillin was discovered entirely by accident by a man described as a careless lab technician. Fortunately for the rest of the world and for all of medical science, that lab technician, Sir Alexander Fleming, must not have been terribly fastidious about cleaning his equipment. Fleming worked for the laboratory of the inoculation department at St. Mary's Hospital in London. He had been conducting research into the flu virus, and part of his research involved growing a culture of Staphylococcus bacteria. He left the culture to grow, and then he went on vacation for a couple of weeks. When he returned from his vacation, the results of Fleming's carelessness were immediately visible. The culture plate where he was growing the staph bacteria was full of penicillin mold. However, he noticed that the presence of the mold was hindering the growth of the bacteria. Further examination showed that the mold was producing a chemical to protect itself, which he named penicillin. In 1929, Fleming published this discovery in the British Journal of Experimental Pathology and presented it to the Medical Research Club. Surprisingly, nobody really seemed to care at first. Maybe his colleagues didn't understand the gravity of the situation, or perhaps they just thought it was a bit of a coincidence. Fleming would continue his research with penicillin until 1931, and the first human trial wouldn't begin until 1941. One of the big deterrents may have been how difficult it was to produce meaningful quantities of penicillin. Though a large farm of penicillin mold was created for research, only a couple of millimeters of the chemical could be harvested each week. The result was that the subject of the first human trial died not because the penicillin wasn't working, but because they didn't have enough to give him a full course of antibiotics. Fortunately, the process of growing mold Mold to mass produce penicillin has greatly improved, and the world has never been the same since. All of this because one lab technician wasn't great about washing and sterilizing his equipment. Microwave ovens are one of the greatest conveniences in the modern kitchen, and they were developed entirely by accident by one of America's largest defense contractors. Raytheon. More specifically, they were discovered by the engineer Percy Spencer. Despite being a self-taught engineer, Percy was already well-known and highly regarded within Raytheon prior to this discovery, with several patents already under his belt. He was described as having a knack for finding simple solutions to manufacturing problems. At the time of his invention, Percy was working on increasing the power of magnetron tubes that would be used in military radar equipment. One day, as lunchtime was approaching, he reached into his pocket to pull out a snack. It's most widely reported as a Mr. Goodbar, though there is some debate over exactly what delicious treat he was expecting to indulge in. Whatever the snack had originally been, when Percy's hand went into his pocket, all he found was a warm, sticky mess of peanuts. It occurred to him that the microwaves may have resulted in a heating up of the food, but he needed to be sure. If it was indeed a chocolate bar in his pocket, those are a pretty low melting point, so he would need more evidence to prove that it was microwaves produced by the magnetron that caused the effect. The next day, Percy brought something in to deliberately heat up. It was something that required a much higher temperature than was needed to make chocolate melt, and it was among the most fitting choices possible. The first food, intentionally cooked with microwaves, was popcorn. He placed the kernels directly next to the magnetron tube, and once they popped, he shared the popcorn with the entire lab. The second experiment was to heat up an egg, which exploded in the face of one of Percy's co-workers. The magnetron was creating a low-density electromagnetic field as it was emanating from the tube. Percy decided to create a high-density field by building a metal box that the magnetron would feed energy into. Because there was no way for the microwaves to escape, food placed inside the box would increase in temperature at an extremely high rate. And thanks to Percy's sweet tooth, we now all have the ability to turn a tub of macaroni and cheese from something that is frozen solid into something that is far too hot to eat in about six minutes. In 
external pacemakers were first created in 1950 and first used in 1952. The machines were large, painful, and most importantly, they were external. A patient on a pacemaker could not leave the hospital, instead normally being hooked up to one for about a week until it was believed that their heart would continue to keep pace as normal. In 1956, this would all begin to change. American engineer and inventor William Greatbatch was trying to create a device that would record a person's heart rhythm. Greybatch was an accomplished inventor who would hold over 325 patents in his lifetime, but sometimes even the most skilled engineers can make mistakes. The mistake in this instance was using the wrong size resistor for his device. Rather than just recording a heartbeat as intended, his device was releasing intermittent charges of electricity. The rhythm of these charges almost exactly mimicked that of a human heartbeat. This device was still just a malfunctioning recorder and couldn't be used as an internal pacemaker, but it did make Great Batch realize that an internal pacemaker could be possible. All there was left to do was to build one. Seeing as he had almost created one by accident, designing a machine to serve his purpose would barely be a challenge for the skilled inventor. After fiddling with the design and some extensive animal testing, Great Batch's internal pacemaker was first put to use in humans in 1960. However, he wasn't the first to market with an internal pacemaker. The first pacemaker was implanted in Sweden in late 1958, but it failed after only three hours. It was replaced, but the new pacemaker only lasted two days. Great Batch's design was a vast improvement on the earlier Swedish model, largely because it used primary cells rather than rechargeable batteries. The first self-starting matches were deployed in 1805 by French chemist Jean Chancel. The heads of the matches consisted of chemicals like sulfur, and to ignite them, they were dipped into a bottle made from asbestos that contained sulfuric acid. Though the matches worked, they were as dangerous as they were expensive, so they never caught on. Just over 20 years later, in 1826, English chemist and pharmacist John Walker would invent a much more practical and cost-effective solution. Walker was already interested in trying to create something like a matchstick. There were already plenty of mixtures that were known to easily ignite and explode, but these weren't useful if you were just trying to light a small or fire rather than blow something up. Walker was trying to find a compound that could easily transmit a flame from the source of the ignition onto something that would then burn slower, like a piece of wood. One day he was mixing yet another compound that he hoped might do the trick. He noticed that a dried clump of his mixture contained mostly sulfur and sulfide of antimony and it was stuck on the end of a mixing stick. Walker scraped the end of his stick against the hearth to remove the clump and it ignited. By complete accident, Walker had just invented the very thing that he'd been trying to invent in the first place. He quickly identified that the key to ignition was to scrape the compound along a rough surface, and he began making and manufacturing boxes of matches. Unfortunately, he wouldn't get any credit for this invention for quite some while. Though his matches worked, they weren't perfect. One of the common problems was that the matches would sometimes burn so hot that the head of the match would burn off from the rest of the match stick and fall onto the floor, onto furniture, or indeed the person holding the match. Because uh, there were still improvements to be made, Walker wasn't interested in patenting the invention. Unfortunately for him, another London chemist, Samuel Jones, was very interested in patenting it. Jones patented and sold his own variation of Walker's matches that he named Lucifers. These still had problems, most notably violent explosions upon striking the match that would sometimes send sparks flying considerable distances. Considering Jones patented someone else's invention, then billed himself as the inventor of the friction match, it seems safe to assume that he didn't really care about about such trivial safety concerns. Leo Bakerland was a Belgian chemist working at a Yonkers, New York. Leo was already wealthy thanks to having invented Vlog's photographic paper, but that wasn't enough to stop his research. He had turned his attentions to a new project, trying to figure out a synthetic replacement for shellac. Shellac had long been used as both a wood finish and a food glaze, but it was always in short supply at the turn of the 20th century when Leo was working on his research. At the time, shellac was still produced naturally from the secretions of lac insects, so the supply would always be dependent on the supply and production of the insects. Though he would eventually succeed in his goal, that product would not go over so well. That didn't really matter, though, because he was already rich, and his accidental invention was only going to make him richer. While experimenting with phenol and formaldehyde to try and produce a synthetic alternative to shellac, he instead created the world's first synthetic resin, known as polyoxybenzimethyllencolonhydride. He called the project Bakelite. Naturally, baby it after himself, but today, 
we know better as plastic. Though plastics existed beforehand, none were completely synthetic before this. They relied on organic compounds such as cellulose from plants, which meant that much like shellac, supplies would be limited by the amount of the organic compound that could be produced. Bakelite posed no such problems, and after filing a number of patents, Leo immediately got to work producing as much of the material as he could. The importance of this discovery did not elude him at all, and he immediately speculated on the thousand and one articles that it could be used to make. Bakelite was an immediate success, and by 1910, it was already doing enough business to necessitate expansion of production. For better or worse, this accidental discovery of synthetic plastic has revolutionized the world. Students can now major in plastics engineering in college, and roughly 380 million metric tons of plastic are produced every single year. Now, that's a pretty huge number, so to give you an idea of scale, it's roughly the combined weight of every person on Earth. We would never have been able to produce that amount of plastic each year if we'd relied solely on using organic compounds. A massive industry, an entire branch of science, and a serious environmental concern that costs Americans billions of dollars every year are all the result of one man's accidental discovery because he wanted to help people keep their furniture looking shiny. We end today with an amazing discovery from the field of culinary science. The chocolate chip cookie. Cookies have been around since the 7th century, but adding chocolate was a much later addition. Until the 16th century, when conquistadors returned to Europe from the Americas, the continent was largely even wholly unaware that cacao even existed. Once they had it, it remained prohibitively expensive for centuries. The introduction of chocolate into cookies seems to have first taken place in the late 1800s, with Cadbury filing a patent for a chocolate-coated cookie in 1891. Everyone's favorite chocolate sandwich cookie, Hydrox, was then introduced in 1908 and was shortly followed by the cheap imitation brand Oreo in 1912. These seem to be among the earliest chocolate-flavored cookies, but chocolate chip cookies were still nearly 30 years away. The major culinary breakthrough would not take place until the late 1930s at the Toll House Inn in Whitman, Massachusetts. Ruth Graves Wakefield, one of the owners and operators of the inn, decided to bake chocolate cookies for her guests. Upon discovering she was out of baker's chocolate, she instead decided to chop up a bar of Nestle semi-sweet chocolate. As we mentioned oh, when discussing the invention of the microwave oven, chocolate has a low melting point, so Ruth assumed that the chocolate would just melt and disperse among the rest of the batter. As we now know, her reasonable assumption was incorrect. Though the chocolate softened, it remained trapped within the batter where it had been placed. Guests loved the cookies, and by 1938 she had published her recipe. In 1939, Nestle purchased the Toll House name and the rights to publish the recipe on their products. After trying to develop a bar that was easier to chop up, they instead released bags of morsel, also referred to as chocolate chips so that the cookies could be more easily made. Now, while this is the most commonly told version of the story and Nestle's purchase in 1939 is definitely accurate, there's dispute as to whether the chocolate chip cookie was an accident or not. Ruth held a degree in household arts and had built the Toll House Inn's reputation on the back of her extraordinary dessert, so there is a good chance she knew exactly what would happen when she put the cut-up chocolate in her cookies. Though people can't agree whether the invention of the chocolate chip cookie was an accident or intentional, oh well, we can all agree that it's delicious.